Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and thank you for stopping by once again. Uh, I've got quite a few things I want to cover. I want I have some downloads, I have some links to send you to that you might find interesting. So let's get with it. I'm going to be uh, looking at my notes occasionally here to so make sure I don't skip over anything. But it, And there's some stuff I need to quote. Very good. First off, uh, possibly as early as uh, July 1st, which is next week, we may have no longer need to wear masks in public places. Point. Okay? You, you might be delighted. I'm sure everyone's delighted to some extent. You will find that a lot of people here will continue to wear masks, especially those who are in constant uh, contact with the public, particularly those who are in contact with the public from coming from all around the world. They're sensitive to this, especially so, as, and so forth. Um, and others who are just... We didn't get the flu last year because we were wearing the masks all the time. We figured that it would be just as good for flu season this year. People, many people won't feel that way. You don't have to. I don't, nobody has to. But the key point for you here is if you're going to sit into the, and go into a room and sit in an office or go out on a property visit and your purpose is to talk to a lawyer, talk to a bank official about setting up an account or talk to somebody about purchasing a property or whatever, uh, or talk with a, a real estate agent who has to deal with lots and lots of people. If you start off in your first meeting wearing a mask, just slip it on, walk in, and then th that's polite. That's saying to them, I'll, I I'll let you decide. Uh, I'm just going to walk in and, and without it because you will have noticed already that people are still wearing those masks. So when you get in and you do that, this kind of polite action is recognized in Panama. It really is. <laughs> it's true. And uh, lacking that is, um, well, it, it just gives you, instead of starting with a zero, you're starting with a plus one. And after that, you, they may not care about the mask and so forth. Uh, they may say thank you very much and appreciate it. Uh, you don't know. The person selling the apartment might have an immediate offensive reaction to somebody who walks in uh, without it when others are wearing them. And when he's when they're wearing it, and you're not, okay? So just a little thing like that can make a difference in how much you pay and whether or not you get the service you want in the time that you would like to have it done. Okay, enough on that. Uh, as far as sales, I'm slowly getting information from up the coast and also from around the city. This is what I, I wait till information actually comes in of actual sales and so forth uh, to get an idea of what's going on because we don't have the statistics yet, nor are we likely to get them anytime soon, pinpointing what's exactly what's going on anywhere. That's not what we do here, uh, because we just don't have a big enough market to pay for it. It boils down to it's a lot of work involved. So, whatever. The key point is that here, the, the, best, the sector that's holding up the best here, and where the discounts are not as high, is the highest one. It's the half million and up group in the urban area particularly. And this is the business community, guys. I mean, they <laughs> they may have had to leave uh, during the course of the pandemic, but they're back. Business is still here, and they're continuing to come. And because of the the situation right now is that we look so good compared to so what's well, just about everybody else in Latin America that we're continuing to get interest in, in activities here. They're not closing down, put it that way. And some are growing, and new ones are coming. So the result is... Those homes, um, they're, they're not people who are desperately need to sell. They are, tend to be high-ranking high ranking, uh, management people for firms all over the world, including many from Latin America, but also from Europe, Asia, everywhere. And this is where they bought, and it's as much an investment for them as it is a home while they're working in the business. Uh, so it it's probably has to do with that. And then it might have to do with some people coming from, uh, with high incomes, coming from troubled Latin American economies who have plenty of money and they want something nice up here and, and from their perspective. And that means a home that's going to run them six hundred, seven hundred thousand uh, dollars $700,000. These people are, are coming. Not huge numbers yet. I spent hours this weekend going over the migration statistics, but it's very clear where the upward movement and the increasing numbers of people are coming from, and it's from Latin America. So I will have more to say on that when the time comes. So the key is, is that that market's held up well, and that's likely to continue to do so for some time. Now, 
Uh, secondly, the coastal sales. <laughs> All right, I've, I've been hearing this from time to time, ah, but I just recently heard about 15 properties that were sold at list price, what they were advertising. Uh, may I take a moment to speak to these people? Should they be listening? Thank you. Thank you so much. We genuinely really, really, really do appreciate your your enthusiasm and your faith in our market. Please come back again soon. We'll be happy to help you. Now, for the rest of you who are interested in making a deal and getting a, you know, a discount off the, for heaven's sakes, the list price or the advertised price, <laughs> don't do that. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, what's happening here, I don't know specifically, and i careful how I push for the specific details because I'm not... I don't, I don't want to get involved with that. All I want to say is this. They may have reasons for this. They may, have, again, have money and they're just buying something for the sake of a, of a visa. Uh, one thing or another, who knows? We don't. But there's no excuse for not seeking a bargain unless that bargain is going to throw you below the threshold you need to meet in order to get the visa. Uh, no, I doubt that's the situation. We have a lot of strange people here, a lot of people coming from all over the world. You, there's no one size fits all. There's a lot of different kinds of folks. This is not a good way to approach it, but it's, it got started up there and managed to make it in, in one area. Uh, I don't anticipate it happening much less. Remember, we had, they, by the estimate of the real estate sector itself, in the newspapers or what have you, 20 to 25,000 vacant properties before the pandemic, which is triple, almost triple, our normal inventory, and on top of that, we've added those that have come up as a result of the pandemic. And at the prices there, it was announced they had already fallen from 2016 to 2019 by 30 percent, had fallen another 10. Well, then a few months later in 2021, they were down more, 15, and so forth. The key point is that they aren't saying that anymore, and it didn't make any difference. They, they knew you weren't reading it, <laughs> so it's okay. They could actually say that. I was stunned because, not stunned, but I was really surprised. And usually, usually this sort of negative news does not go out into the general public because, after all, Panamanian public also takes part in home buying in this country. So, anyhow, it did. And more power, I mean, thank you for being honest enough because we needed to under confront reality. Now we're needing to pick up our spirits and so talk about people who, who pay list and what have you are going to, uh, is going to help pump people up, and they need that to, to get up in the morning and get out to work, and I understand that. Uh, does, but in this instance, anything I talk about, something like that, I have it from somebody who was there, you know. So I, 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 it's not something I just hear from somebody who heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody and so forth. No. Uh, and that isn't the first time. Oh, gosh, before the pandemic, we had one person pick up five properties for uh, about a million and a half um, or less uh, at a 40, 45 percent discount. Um, on the coast, and so there's no excuse. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't even think about not going. They may have lowered the price in anticipation of difficulties, but they haven't lowered the price as far as they they expect to, and that's what they do. They expect to. All right, that's enough on that one. Now the next one. This is we're going to get into the more interesting stuff now. I suspect um, there was an interview very recently in uh, a Martos Financiero which is another way of saying Financial Tuesday. This is a publication from one of our newspapers here in town. It's on Tuesday. It's in a special edition they put out with the newspaper. It has just economic financial news in it. And this was a very, very interesting uh, conversation, interview, with uh, one of the vice presidents at Tower Bank. That's one word, T-O-W-E-R, Bank, Tower Bank which is a perfectly good bank here in, in town. And they were announcing cryptocurrency accounts, or that seemed to be how it was, how it was being referred to. A crypto accounts. Crypto is very big now. We know we have uh, a group down, tend to be younger, have, they've cashed out some money, they've got some, you know, still got a considerable amount of money from it. Um, they're willing to spend and so forth. So, and others who have crypto, we're, we're delighted to see that, but, Nobody's been so audacious in reaching out to the market and talking about having crypto accounts, crypto-friendly accounts, and so forth. Let me quote you from the article. I want to say right off the bat, 
as I've said before, I think cryptocurrencies have a great future. They're just going to have to get themselves organized in such a way that average people can buy them safely and not worry the market's going to collapse or it's going to get stolen or one thing or another. Okay? Uh, and that is yet to come. And as simple as that. So we're working on it. And we don't want to make it, we don't want to blow it. Or we ruin the market for everybody. So. Uh, here's what Tower Bank had to say about it. And this is their, you see, this is the good part. Is that they're the ones explaining it, not some reporter or somebody else. Um, and explaining how it's done. See, the gentleman said, cryptocurrencies as such are not accepted, but they must change that money to fiat or current currency of the country, in this case to the dollar, in a first phase. And in the future, we hope to receive cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin for deposits. Okay. They're not accepting, you're not going to have your bitcoins in a bank account. It's simple as that. You're going to have dollars. You have to sell, you have to turn them into dollars. You turn them into dollars. Uh, the bank's not going to be buying them from you. I feel <laughs> pretty confident of that. So you put those dollars into your account with Tower Bank. All right. Now, as he goes on to say, it should be clarified that it is not a new financial product. They are the same regular savings or current checking accounts, but identified as crypto-friendly accounts, and the bank's resources can be transferred to a cryptocurrency exchange platform. Okay, fine. They're just like every other account. They're dollars in a dollar account, and when the time comes that you want to move them to another financial institution that's going to provide you with bitcoins, uh, they will make the transfer. No problem. Now, banks are required to know their client. That's how it's stated down here. And they're quite demanding, and people find out when they try to set up an account here for the first time that it's a little more complex than they expected. And it can take a while, and they may ask for your copies of your tax returns. They may ask uh, for all sorts of references, bank references. They will call the bank references in whatever country you're from. They will do a job of it. They have to. And they prepare a little, a little file on you at the bank. And uh, then they determine whether they're opening the account and so forth. Now, they will tend to work on this very quickly and positively if you bring a whole pile of money. Otherwise, it can drag. And some people know it can take silly periods, like two, three weeks just to get a savings account opened, which was my you know, case. back. That was everybody back in the day. We were really struggling way back then. But now, not, it can be a real problem. And some banks won't even open accounts if they're not a certain size. I mean, it's just crazy. But whatever. This is just a standard account. All right. Now, uh, for the part of knowing our clients, all the data of the person will be taken as required by financial regulations. Okay. They'll have your name. They'll have your address. They'll have your passport number. They'll have your cellular number. They'll have your phone call, uh, phone numbers, and everything else, just like they would for anybody having an account there. All right. Uh, he says, you would be surprised at the amount of transparency that cryptocurrencies have, as it is a non-modifiable public ledger. Every transaction is recorded and can be traced. Yeah. Actually, a lot of people aren't aware uh, how easy it is to trace. But anyhow, that's true. Uh, and how do they go about doing it? The bank acquired Chainalysis, a software for monitoring and auditing uh, including risk analysis of cryptocurrency operations. Uh, okay. So I will be giving you links to all of this, uh, including a link to that chain analysis, so you can see that sort of information they get, and, and that needs to meet the banking superintendent's requirements for, for to be sure that people understand this is not just to, to drug dealing money or anything of that sort. Not for one second, thank you. Um, the rest of the Marte Financiero article here, I'll give you the one in Spanish and also one that is uh, from Firefox, which is the Google translation. If it doesn't work for you, just go back to the Spanish one and right-click on it and have it do it for you. But anyhow, uh, I'll give both links uh, to it so you have a chance to read it yourself. I purposely picked out the things I thought needed to be mentioned because basically for what I just described, let's call it a euro account. You can have a euro-friendly account here in Panama. You bring euros, you transfer them, change them into dollars, they will be happy to set up a bank account in dollars. Then when the time comes that you need to have those transferred to Germany where they will have to be turned into uh, euros, 
uh, they will be happy to make the transfer to Germany and in dollars, and they will make it in, turn it into euros. But then you're not going to have any euros in your bank account. <laughs> so that it's crypto friendly. And the message that Tower Bank is getting across, and I salute them for this, is that we know, we hear you, your market segment. Uh, we want you to know we'll be there when the day comes. Until then, this is what we can offer you. And uh, we hope it is a sign of good faith that we really are truly interested in dealing with the blockchain and with uh, cryptocurrencies. But you need to understand, and some do not that you're not keeping your cryptocurrency, your Bitcoins or your Ethereum or whatever, in a an account as as crypto. No, 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 no. This is, again, this is not El Salvador. Okay, I wanted to share that with you. Um, oh boy, there is another one I thought was very well done. Actually, uh, it's from a website called the Evidence Based Investor. I don't know that much about it, but it seems like a reasonable place. And this is a very interesting article. I'm going to give you a link to that, too. And it's, the title is wonderful. How susceptible are you to financial bullshit? Pardon the language. But the fact of the matter is that this is the term being used. It was first used back, I think, 2005. You, you can read about it by a uh, uh, professor of philosophy, I think it was. It, how he defines bullshit. He it says it's, it's phony information. Now, it's not a lie, but it's phony. That is, I had somebody for, oh, gosh, I had a dozen people coming to me back in the big financial crisis saying, Bob, Bob, the, the gringos aren't coming. The Americans aren't coming down. They're just not coming. They're leaving. They're leaving in large numbers. We're going to lose our gringo community. Yeah. And I said, I don't see any evidence of that, a retirement wave or anything at all. I said, oh, yes. You know, it's true. It's it, we we know we we can see it. It's happening. Actually, other things were happening, but they didn't catch on yet. I mean, among other things, they weren't buying the services that these people were offering. But anyhow, the key point was that's what drove me to go out there and get the statistics from Social Security Administration that have indicated clearly that that was not the case. So, uh, but their information was sincere and and meant to be just what it was, and I I, I understood that. But it was phony. In other words, it did not have anything to back it up other than their opinion based on their experience. And that is not good enough. And that you're going to get plenty of that when you're down here. It's not a lie. It's phony. <laughs> it's bullshit is what this particular man is saying. No, he said, who is the most susceptible to it? I love this section here. The authors, this is in Sweden, by the way, for those who think of think it's a cultural difference, so be it. Um, I don't. <laughs> but anyhow, it sounds reasonable. The authors found the people best able to detect financial bullshit were older women with lower incomes who were not overconfident in their financial expertise. Also notable was that levels of education appeared to make no difference in the bullshit detection scale. In contrast, the biggest dupes <laughs> the fools, whatever you want to call them, dupes for financial nonsense tended to be young, overconfident, high-income males. <laughs> so if you want somebody to uh, advise you on your investments, try to find an older woman uh, <laughs> who, with limited income and who has very little confidence in herself. <laughs> but it's, it, it makes a lot more sense than you might think. And it gives also a, a link to the uh, original, the, the actual study itself, and to tell you how they went about doing it and everything else, and how they defined this and that and whatever. Uh, but it's an interesting one. And I think it's a good one to read now because that's what I'm looking for at this stage, and I'm finding bits and pieces of it, and I'm going to be jumping at it when I see it, and, and not because I'm antagonistic toward any people or group or anything else, but because you need the straight story. You need to think about it and, and look at it uh, analytically. That is from... The, from the practical viewpoint, not just from fulfilling a dream. Dreams are wonderful, but to make the dream real, and I know I've screwed it up many times myself, to make the dream real, you've got to have the right information and have your mind in the right set and understand the environment in which you're working, and above all, have lots of contacts and friends here in Panama and have people who can help you. And not trust your own judgment without the assistance of others who know more about the country. 
you have to judge them too as whether or not they're worthwhile or they're good people or not. Take your time. Okay? If you're talking about a major investment, I'm talking to investors particularly here. Uh, I, I've seen some very – there. you can go around this country and you can find very few developments that are run by Americans or Canadians for that matter. Uh, they, they didn't – some got started, but no. other than, say, Sam Taliaferro, who did a wonderful job in Boquete, but he was living in Costa Rica at the time, married to a Panamanian. Now, there's a whole different story of that. The key thing I learned from the first decade I was here was that young people under the age of 30, 35, they were very good. Not all of them. They, some of them failed, but there are a number of them. And why, why they were good and successful in setting up businesses that even today they still own and operate and are very successful, although people may not know that they're Americans that are running it or own it, that own it. They hire Panamanians. But the uh, simple fact is they were people who really dedicated themselves to it. They came without a lot of money, uh, but they, they worked their butts off. They got to know a lot of people in their own age group, which is helpful, which got them introductions to others. Um, they learned to speak the language fluently. They really did understand the culture. They had, uh, and they worked their butts off again and again and again. And they, they, they sacrificed and so forth. They lived in sometimes very simple surroundings at first. Um, there, it was, a, it was a wonder to watch them uh, do it and do it so well. They came out very, having been very successful. I don't know whether the younger crowd coming down this time is that way. I don't find them that they're not the same people, but it doesn't mean they can't do the same thing. But they do need to be very focused on this. They, some of them now are bringing down much more money than anybody brought down before. Uh, but I'm that of their age group. And that's wonderful. But that all the more they need some whatever assistance they can get. And uh, just as those people did, and they have to work their butts off, there's no escaping that. Uh, so I encourage that of any age group, you understand that. And, oh, how did they get the money to do the things they did back then? Friends and family. And whatever they were able to put together themselves. And they did it in stages. I mean, it's, there's some wonderful stories. I know about this because U.S. News and World Report got a hold of me and uh, asked, could I in introduce them to people, this is 15 years ago, whatever, uh, who young Americans in this instance, who would come down and set up businesses successfully. And I said, sure. So we set up interviews with various and sundry people here, different types of businesses. And their man came down, a really good, good, sharp, sharp man, sharp questions, not, you know, looking for the good story, looking for the real story. And uh, he did a fine job, I thought. Um, and it was very successful. But I, I was able, in a matter of like three days, they gave me almost no warning. <laughs> I had to go out and find people to do that. I'd have difficulty doing that now because that group is beyond that. You know, they're not into that any longer. They're, much, they're middle-aged now. Uh, whereas the new group, I don't know enough of them who had the, the ability, had the time yet to get to the level of success that these people had at that time. But I'm sure they're out there. And I, and I, you know, I did the surveys of the American people on this. And these are what Barons. I wrote about it there. That's why I was on CNBC, blah, 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 blah. And the point I kept making is that the largest groups that were interested in relocating overseas, living there, investing there, and so forth, were in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And not retirees, way behind, in much smaller numbers. So, this is, uh, none of this comes as a surprise. I like them. More the better. But I like to help them too. So, enough on that. Thank you very much for stopping by. There are other things happening. They're relatively smaller, but I'll get to them in the next video. Thank you.